Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled The Long Journey Toward Developing a Biomarker Panel for Lung Cancer Screening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sam Panache, the Director of Red and Sherlin McCombs Institute for the Early Detection and Treatment of Cancer at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Hanash was recruited to MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2011 to lead the Red and Charlene McCombs Institute for Cancer Early Detection and Treatment. He was previously program head of molecular diagnosis at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Dr. Hanash's interest and expertise are in the field of cancer diagnostics and the development of blood-based cancer biomarkers for risk assessment and cancer early detection. He is the inaugural president of the International Human Proteome Organization dedicated to the study of the human proteome and the founder of the U.S. Human Proteome Organization. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that you want to arise during the presentation, simply type them into the Q&A box on the right, and Dr. Anash will answer questions following the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Sam Hanash. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Well, uh, I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to share with you this long journey toward developing a biomarker panel for lung cancer screening. This um, journey started out when I was in Seattle at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and it has <clears throat> accentuated and when i moved from seattle to houston to be the director of the red and charlene mccombs institute for the early detection and treatment of cancer this is an institute that regroups several centers adam d anderson including the center for global cancer early detection um, for disclosure, I'm receiving support for this program from Abbott. And at the same time, we have filed IP and done some licensing for markers for uh, lung cancer uh, screening. Um, you may ask, there's already screening going on for lung cancer at the present time uh, based on low dose CT. So why do we need markers for screening? Well, the answer is on this slide here. At the present time, based on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations for low-dose CT, you have to be a smoker that has smoked 30 pack years and um, that are currently smoking or quit within the past 15 years to be eligible for low-dose CT. On the other hand, at the present time, most subjects destined to be diagnosed and die of lung cancer do not meet those screening criteria. And so the question becomes, what do we do for those subjects that are currently not eligible for CT screening? And so the answer would be that, uh, why not consider a blood test that we would do for a smoker that would determine the risk of having lung cancer. So they may not be 30 pack year smokers, they could be 10 pack year smokers, or they could be 30 pack year smokers that quit more than 15 years. If their blood test turns out to be positive, indicating a risk for lung cancer just as high as the 30 pack year smoker, then uh, why not then have that blood test available? We go to the doctor for checkup, we get our cholesterol checked, and we take that for granted these days. And so if somebody is a smoker and there is a blood test that determines their risk, then why not use that as a way to improve basically screening for lung cancer and reduce mortality, which is substantial. As we know, lung cancer is the number one cancer killer worldwide. Um, and so there has been concern for quite some time now about the restrictive nature 
of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation of 30 pack years and quitting less than 15 years. And so as a result of the concerns and some recent modeling that has been done, then the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is now considering, considering recommending uh, reducing the pack year requirement to 20 pack years. And so if this is indeed is implemented, then of course more subjects destined to be diagnosed uh, with lung cancer and die of lung cancer would have been screened and their cancer detected at an early stage. And so uh, with those new recommendations in mind, one would think that, okay, we have solved that problem. Still, even with reducing the pack years down to 20, there's still the issue of subjects who did not even smoke 20 pack years or maybe even did not smoke at all, then could be destined to uh, be diagnosed with lung cancer and the diagnosis would be an advanced stage. And so there's still a lot of merit for developing a blood test that allows a subject's risk for lung cancer to be assessed. Now, we also have to keep in mind that not every subject who would be eligible for screening with low-dose CT is actually getting screened with low-dose CT. The uptake has been very, very low. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you need to make an appointment to get a CT. You need to have uh, basically an imaging test that may be or may not be reimbursed. And at the same time, one has to give consideration to the fact that, that, well, okay, you got your first CT and it was negative, then what would you do next? Well, it's not very clear at the present time, but maybe you would be getting your CT every year. And so you could imagine after 20 or 30 years that you would have had a lot of CTs and sort of like uh, the joke around is that you're going to increase somebody's risk on account of being exposed to CT. Uh, although that incre incremental risk is really very modest. But nevertheless, there's uh, quite a, a justification for wanting to have a blood test to aid in CT screening. Now, um, if you look at it from that perspective, then you could have your blood test done before you do a CT. On the other hand, a blood test could be a companion to CT because we know the limitations of CT. There's overdiagnosis. There are nodules that are seen by CT that may or may not turn out to be cancer. And at the same time, there are cases where a CT is done and before they are due for the next CT a year later, they are diagnosed with lung cancer. And lo and behold, they are not only diagnosed with lung cancer, they are diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. And so having a blood test that complements CT, either prior to CT or in conjunction with CT would be appealing. So this is kind of like the positive speech about the, a blood test that would aid in screening for lung cancer and reducing mortality. Now, here's the problem. So if you go to PubMed and ask, well, has anyone worked on biomarkers for lung cancer? Are there any publications there? And when I did that, as I was preparing my talk here, uh, the number of publications related to lung cancer and biomarkers turned out to be 35,452 publications. And you would say, oh my God, I mean, there's so much work that has been done. And yet there is no biomarker panel available today that aids in screening for lung cancer. And so you may say, well, biomarkers could have all kinds of uh, uh, indications in relation to lung cancer, maybe not screening. And so can we be a little bit more specific? So, okay, well, let's do a PubMed search of lung cancer screening and biomarkers. And that number goes down to 13,654, wow. Now, okay, let's be even more specific and let's say lung cancer screening and blood-based biomarkers, that number still is as high as more than 4,000 
papers talking about blood biomarkers and lung cancer screening, 4,830. So if you want to start in this area, let's say that you are a diagnostics company or you're thinking about, well, we need a sort of a blood test for lung cancer, let's look at what the opportunities are. And if the first thing that you do is to do a PubMed search and come up with 4,830 publications, you would say, whoa, if all kinds of people in companies and academia or what have you all over the world have been working on lung cancer screening and blood biomarkers came up with those, that's such an astounding number of papers and still nothing is out there, then there must be a problem. And so what could that problem be? Here's on the next slide. This is the problem. If you sit down with a pencil and piece of paper and ask yourself, what could there be in the blood that could inform about lung cancer? And well, then the answer to that is pretty straightforward. You could be looking at any one of at least a dozen different types of markers, molecules, and what have you in the blood. And so those could be circulating tumor cells. Those could be microparticles like exosomes coming out of tumors. They could be proteins. They could be metabolites. They could be DNA. And DNA could be all kinds of different uh, groupings of DNA, it could be mutations, it could be DNA methylation, it could be nucleic acid, microRNAs, or even RNA. And you say, wow, I mean, how are we going to figure out what works and what does not work? And so all of this is really my introduction to how at MD Anderson we approached our search for biomarkers that will aid in lung cancer screening. And so we decided that we are going to go through every paper that has been published about lung cancer, lung cancer screening, blood-based biomarkers, and try to see which ones in there have some legitimate finding that could be relevant to screening. If there are several papers that have worked on the same type of biomarker, let's say microRNA, then we would ask, okay, well, you have a group in Italy, a group in Spain, a group in Cleveland or whatever, that have worked on microRNA for lung cancer, did they find something in common? And most of the time, remarkably, uh, the answer is no. There are so many different studies that have been done and each one going in a different direction and not finding the same thing. And so we decided that we are going to kind of sift through, triage all of those publications and look at what would be promising biomarkers because the design of the study is relevant. Most of the time what you see is people looked at advanced stage cancer, they found something interesting and they sort of assumed that it could be relevant to the detection of very early stage cancer when the subjects are asymptomatic. And the answer is that if you go through that route, uh, you are going to be quite disappointed. And so we applied a triage mechanism whereby we would look at any which large number, any one of a large number of biomarker types and biomarkers and see what we could come up with by way of markers that pass the initial kind of sort of triage beyond actually just triaging the paper and the uh, candidates that were described in that paper. And so that's the approach that we have followed. And so in order to do that, and if your application is screening for lung cancer, again, like I mentioned earlier, it is not very informative to work with blood that was collected at the time of diagnosis from subjects with advanced stage cancer. And so what is the alternative to that? Well, the alternative as is shown on this slide is working with blood that was collected from newly diagnosed early stage subjects. And more importantly, work with blood that was collected 
at a time the subject did not know that they were going to be diagnosed with lung cancer. And this is through population studies, cohorts, epidemiology type of studies that have been done, whereby 10,000, 20,000, whatever thousand number of subjects have been uh, basically enrolled in the study and blood was collected at baseline. And so if you have 10,000 subjects that have been uh, enrolled in a study and their blood was collected at baseline, some of those are destined to be diagnosed with this or that cancer. And then you could go back to their blood at the time they were asymptomatic and ask, okay, this potential biomarker, does it validate in this type of a setting? And if it validates, you keep it on the list. If it doesn't validate, you take it out. So this is a very substantial undertaking that we have done. For example, the initial work that we did in addition to newly diagnosed subjects with early stage lung cancer, we worked with the Women's Health Initiative, and this is a cohort of 160,000 women that we had access to blood from women that later were diagnosed with lung cancer. We worked with the CARET cohort, which is a cohort of some 16,000 subjects at risk for lung cancer and that kind of smoking. Blood was collected at baseline, and then we were able to look at blood within a year of diagnosis of lung cancer and ask what could we find in there and can we validate our finding in a different cohort type of thing. And so we relied on particular cohort to build a panel of biomarkers. And then once we have built that panel of biomarkers, we relied on additional cohort to validate that panel. And so we went from newly diagnosed early stage, uh, Women's Health Initiative cohort, the CARE cohort, we built a particular panel that was the intent and then we validated in, a, in two European cohorts that number approximately half a million subjects that blood was collected at baseline. And we used those blood from subjects that later were diagnosed with lung cancer to validate a panel that we had already established. So that got us a step further. And now where we are at is we want to go from a research setting into a setting where the uh, assays are clinical grade assays. So we would do the ultimate validation in blood that was collected either through yet an additional cohort, the prostate, lung, colon, ovarian, NCI cohort, where blood was collected at baseline and on a regular basis. And at MD Anderson, we launched a lung cancer screening cohort that we, uh, for subjects that come in for screening for lung cancer, and we have blood that has been collected from well over 500 uh, blood collections from those subjects. And some of them obviously were diagnosed with lung cancer on account of CT screening. And we could use those blood tests to validate the marker, yet another validation. <clears throat> and so this is the approach that we have followed. Now I'll have to go back uh, a few years uh, back to maybe, 2013, 2014, when we asked ourselves, can we really come up with markers that could be valid before subjects are diagnosed with lung cancer at the time they were asymptomatic? And so we did a, uh, this was a proteomics mass spectrometry study whereby we looked at blood from mouse models of lung cancer. And the advantage of those mouse models of lung cancer is that you can collect blood before you turn on the cancer causing gene, and then you can sequentially collect blood and ask yourself using an advanced uh, proteomics mass spectrometry platform, can we see changes in the blood early on with tumor development? And we would do a similar sort of analysis of blood collected from human subjects and then look at what uh, is common both to mouse blood and to human blood. And so lo and behold, we found a lot of uh, uh, molecules, proteins in the blood that go up with tumor development in humans and the mouse. And those are shown in a uh, very, very fine font here in red for 
those that go up and in green for those proteins that go down. And so there's a collection of proteins in the blood that went up with tumor development. And so statistics show that those, uh, a lot of those proteins were associated with tumor development. But the question is, okay, well, statistics is interesting, but it doesn't give you a, a, a clue as to biology. But we had a smart MD, PhD postdoc working on this project, and he did a lot of searches for those things that go up in the blood, trying to figure out why did they go up. And lo and behold, it turned out that a lot of those features, protein features in the blood that go up, are regulated by NKX2.1. And what is NKX2.1? It's a proto-oncogene that has been linked to the development of lung cancer at early stages. So that was super exciting for us. And this came out in cancer cell and made the cover. And that basically, yes, there is a prospect of being able to develop a blood test that could pick up cancer early on before onset of symptoms. So we were very excited about this at the time. And it was really the justification of not simply wanting to pursue the type of study that we had done and validated, but wanting to do go all out and look at any potential biomarker in an unbiased fashion and see what holds up the best in terms of being promising for lung cancer screening. And so, when we did that initial study and the one that came out in cancer cell that I showed uh, you on the previous slide, what was interesting is one of the markers that was being turned on by, by NKX 2.1 was surfactant B. And so we all know about surfactant as a physiologic uh, factor in the blood uh, 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 related to, uh, to, to lung physiology. And so when we looked at our data more precisely, it turned out that actually it wasn't the mature form of surfactant B. It was an immature form of surfactant B that is being turned on through NKX 2.1 early on during tumor development. And what you see on this slide is when we compared the performance of surf mature surfactant B, which is the curve in black, with the performance of the prosurfactant B, which is the curve in red, you see that, in fact, prosurfactant B is more informative. The area under the curve for in red for prosurfactant B is superior to the one in black, and the difference has a p-value that was significant. And so we decided to make an assay for prosurfactant B that became ultimately our anchor sort of marker for anything else that we wanted to test that could have relevance for lung cancer screening. So is there evidence that even though you have a good AUC curve, well, we know that smoking represents a major risk factor for lung cancer. So we looked at the pan-Canadian lung cancer screening cohort where subjects could subjects the risk could be defined based on smoking and we asked well would adding just this one marker improve our ability to assess risk compared to the smoking model and what you see here in red is the smoking model risk related to the smoking model and what you see in the, in, in blue is the base basic smoking model to which we have added this one marker, prosurfactant B. And what you can see is there's a significant increment in assessing risk in the pan-Canadian screening cohort. This is a paper that came out in JCO in 2015. And the difference between the performance of the basic screening model, smoking model, and the addition of one marker, the difference in AUC had a p-value of 0 0.0002. So this was really exciting for us and contributed to our conviction that we will be able to come up with a marker panel that determines somebody's risk and the need to be screened by CT for lung cancer. So with that prosurfactant B, you could say, well, could there be a subset of subjects that contributed to the performance? And 
and maybe it was men more than women. It was subjects that were later diagnosed with adeno as opposed to squamous, as opposed to small cell. And when we looked at the data in the pan-Canadian screening, you cannot see the detail here, but I can tell you that any which way we looked at the subjects that were screened, whether in relation to what was their diagnosis exactly, or age, or sex, or what have you, smoking history, then the uh, prosurfactant be performed with a very significant p-value, which added to the conviction that this could be a good marker to be included in a screening biomarker panel. So what was astounding at the time we did the analysis of the pan-Canadian uh, screening uh, data was there were 17 subjects that had a negative CT at baseline. And before they were due for the next CT, were diagnosed with lung cancer. And like I mentioned earlier, they were diagnosed with advanced stage lung cancer. And so we were very eager to see how that one marker, prosurfactant B, performed in that group. And so there are four groupings here that you see on the slide in terms of the values for prosurfactant B. On the left side, it was subjects who had an abnormal CT that turned out not to be lung cancer. The next is subjects with incident lung cancer that had the negative CT, those 17 subjects. And then you have subjects that were diagnosed with lung cancer at the time the CT was done, and subjects that were normal. Those 17 subjects that had a negative CT had the highest value of prosurfactant B than at baseline when the CT was negative which was incredibly, it's like, it still gives me goosebumps that a blood marker can signal the presence of cancer in this fashion for those subjects better than CT itself. So <clears throat> how were we going to look through umpteen types of biomarkers to come up with a panel? And so like I mentioned earlier, with a lot of data that we generated for Persurfactant B, this became our anchor marker. And the next marker that seems to be promising would be added as the next anchor marker type of thing. But it was very important that the assay system would be one that can give you good analytical reproducibility so that you don't have assay-related issues. And then at the end, we thought that when we do all of this exercise, which was pretty daunting and substantial, we're going to come up with the best marker combination and that's what we're going to go with and run with. So, like I said, there are all kinds of different types of uh, potential biomarkers. One platform that we have utilized is metabolomics. We asked, well, could there be metabolites in the blood that could be relevant to assessing somebody's risk for lung cancer? And one metabolite that stood out in our initial discovery and validation work was a polyamine diastilspermine that gave a very good area under the curve when you look at subjects whose blood was collected before a diagnosis of lung cancer. And then the next thing that we did, obviously, was to see, okay, well, this curve kind of looks a little bit like prosurfactant B. Do they complement each other or simply basically have no additive value? And indeed, when we looked at the, for the same subjects so that had uh, prosurfactant B and DAS assayed and looked at the contribution of either one and the two together, then it became very clear that the combination of uh, polyamine DAS and prosurfactant B gave an improved sensitivity at a very high specificity, as you can see in the red curve on the left. And again, that has associated with a good p-value, and that came up as a came out as a follow-up paper in JCO in 2015. So we thought, okay, well, we have two markers already that complement each other. Let's keep going. And so there were a lot of publications about microRNAs, and we selected out of those those types of publications were the same. A microRNA was identified in more than one paper and where they looked at early stage lung cancer. And so we pulled out all of those microRNAs and we assayed them and asked, well, could microRNA make a contribution here? And the answer is yes. And so the microRNAs that validated on their own, when we added them, 
to the other markers that we already have. And by that time, we had quite a cocktail of biomarkers. What you can see here on the curve is prosurfactant V, dystilspermine, and adding to it two microRNAs. And what sort of performance do we get? We get a significant performance. Now, we were very excited about this. And we started talking to our colleagues who are perhaps more in the entrenched in the clinic, in the clinical chemistry lab than we were. And we told them, well, what do you think a combination of metabolized a protein and a microRNA as a way to screen for lung cancer? And they said, boy, that is going to be very complicated. You're talking about three different platform and metabolize. How are you going to assay that? You're going microRNA. How are you going to assay that protein? How are you going to assay that? This is kind of almost like a loser proposition to want to include so many different things. If you think that you're going to have a test that will be implemented among millions of subjects, that's going to be problematic. And so we thought, hmm, what are we going to do? I mean, if it's not practical to have any of which combination of markers, what are we going to do? Well, we thought our lead biomarker that we discovered early on was a protein. Why don't we look to see if there are any other proteins that are supported by the literature that could be good markers to screen for lung cancer? And as we all know, there are quite a few markers out there that are being used clinically for subjects who are diagnosed with lung cancer. So we had those on the list, and we had many others that were promising from the literature and we tested each one of them to see whether they contribute to our basically um, lead biomarker, which is prosurfactant B. And <clears throat> that basically turned out to be very promising. So now what about DNA? There's a lot of interest in DNA. And like I said, it could be DNA methylation, it could be mutation, what have you. And so again, we looked at DNA to see what it would contribute. And fortunately, looking at DNA specifically for mutation, it performed great in advanced stage, but the performance in early stage was rather modest. And so at that point, we decided that let's stick to see what we could get out of the proteins. We will come back to DNA and see if it can contribute uh, down, uh, downstream. Uh, the reason we did that was adding a DNA test to a protein test will jack up the cost considerably, but we obviously did not give up on the DNA. It had some performance, but we decided to focus our effort on proteins. And so we assembled a marker panel of four proteins, and uh, we decided to test it. This marker panel was developed and validated in the CARET pre-diagnostic cohort of smokers at risk for lung cancer ca uh, cases, uh, so, uh, at risk for lung cancer. And the way we tested it was, like I showed on a previous slide, in a completely independent cohort uh, from Europe consisting of UMIA samples and the EPIC pan-European cohort, uh, two studies uh, uh, that are basically our collaborator at the International Agency for Cancer Research provided us with in a blinded fashion to test our marker panel. And the outcome of that blinded validation using yet another independent cohort came out in JAMA Oncology two years ago. And so here is basically the finding that came out in JAMA Oncology. So we looked at blood that was collected a year prior to a diagnosis of lung cancer and looked for the performance of our marker panel in determining subjects' risk of being diagnosed with lung cancer compared with uh, the performance of a model that was primarily based on smoking history. So with smoking history, you can determine somebody's risk and the performance of that uh, basic model is shown in black here. 
and you see the curve in black, and what you have in red is the added performance of a four protein marker panel that we published in JAMA Oncology, then that included our lead marker prosurfactin B. And so when you see, when you look at that curve in red, it's much more performing than simply looking at somebody's smoking history, number one. And when you look at the criteria being used today for screening, if you were to have a blood test, you would have much greater sensitivity at the same specificity. This is looking at the intersection of the horizontal and the vertical line. So at either the same specificity as the USPSTF criteria, we get greater sensitivity, or at the sensitivity of the USPS criteria, PSTF criteria, we get greater specificity. So that was incredibly exciting for us. And so what are we doing at the present time? Going back to the schema for validation that we wanted to implement now almost eight years ago, where we are at today is basically wanting to validate, validate our four marker panel using a clinical grade assay. And we are applying this in a blinded fashion to samples that we received from the NCI that were part of the prostate, lung, colon, ovarian cohort. And so we're doing this in the most rigorous way possible using a clinical grade assay. So over the multiple validation studies that we have done of this four marker panel, whether it's Carrot, Epic, Umia, and the early data that we have now from PLCO, we have robust, very reproducible performance of our four marker protein panel, which makes us think that indeed this is quite robust and it withstood looking at a cohort of smokers, looking at a general population in Europe, looking at a screening cohort that is supported by the NCI, we got the same performance. And so for us, that represents a major milestone in terms of validation studies that we have done. And so I am sure you have seen the news media and the coverage about, well, why do we screen for one cancer at a time? Why don't we screen for all cancers with a blood test? And this way we can save more lives because other modalities may not be that effective. So adding a blood test that could screen for all kinds of cancers could be a good thing. And so there are two papers that were published recently, one in the Annals of Oncology by the Grail Group and the other one that was published in Science by the Thrive Group about uh, basically testing a marker panel that would have uh, merit in detecting multiple cancers. And so the uh, Grail uh, marker panel was based on DNA methylation, whereas the Thrive marker panel was based on proteins on the one hand, protein markers, plus looking at DNA mutations. And so right there, that tells you that there's a lot of possibilities for different types of biomarkers to yield a potentially valid test. And so uh, Dr. Srivastava, the NCI, and myself then were invited to comment about those two studies. And because there was a lot of I mean, you may call it hype or promise or hope, uh, a lot of interest in those studies. And so we basically had a sort of like an opinion piece about the merits of pan cancer sort of screening. And our feeling was, yes, eventually that could be great, but for now it may be a little bit uh, premature, because when you look at the data from Thrive and from Grail, the subjects that were found to be positive, they turn out to be more like advanced stage subjects as opposed to early stage subjects. So this is working with cohorts of newly diagnosed subjects. And a lot of cancers, in particular lung cancer, were missed 
in the prospective cohort that was part of the studies. And so for now, we feel that it may be premature to screen everybody for all kinds of cancer based on a blood test. On the other hand, uh, there's an opportunity to screen subjects at high risk. And again, what better cohort to screen for cancer than heavy duty or even moderate duty smokers because they are at high risk for lung cancer, but also at risk for other cancers. And so our sort of strategy here is let's learn to walk before we start running Let's start seeing what we can do by way of blood testing for subjects at high risk. And obviously smokers are not the only subject at high risk for cancer. For example, obese women have an increased risk of breast cancer and perhaps other cancers, subjects with inherited uh, familial, this or that type of cancer at risk are at risk. And so why don't we start with high risk subjects and see how we can come up with blood test and demonstrate our ability to catch their cancer early. So at this point, basically, this is the strategy that we want to implement at MD Anderson and beginning with subjects at risk for lung cancer and other cancer due to smoking, but also women who uh, may be at risk for breast cancer. We have launched a mammography screening cohort to be able to develop and improve eventually our approach to screening for breast cancer using blood tests in combination with imaging modalities. Um, so what is the conclusion from my presentation today? Well, I strongly believe that blood-based biomarkers will play a role in cancer screening. First, through subjects at high risk, identifying them and say, okay, you are at high risk for breast cancer, <clears throat> you are at high risk for pancreatic cancer or for lung cancer, and that should trigger the next follow-up, which would logically be an imaging modality. That would be one thing that we have learned. And obviously, uh, blood markers by themselves don't tell you about that there is indeed a cancer or the location of that cancer we feel that blood biomarkers in combination with imaging modality, perhaps at the time of screening, would be very useful and that would reduce the false positives and false negatives associated with imaging. And uh, for now, pain cancer screening with a blood test perhaps should be first uh, uh, optimized and make sure that it works for lung cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer or what have you as opposed to picking out only 5% or 10% of this or that cancer, I think we have a little bit of a way uh, to go. So <clears throat> this is a long journey, like <clears throat> the title of my presentation said, there are a lot of people that have been involved, all some within my group and other collaborators, not only in the US, but also in Europe and China that have been involved in different studies that we have. I cannot basically acknowledge them individually. They are all on this slide here. But more importantly is the funding support that we have received for all of the lung cancer studies that we have done to come up with a marker panel for the different cohorts. We have had different sources of study, but we are really uh, very fortunate and very sort of humbled by the support that we got in MD Anderson through different types of foundations, the Canary Foundation, the Longevity Foundation, the Rupert Science Family Foundation, the User Cancer Fighters, and a uh, very, very supportive Lida Hill Foundation that provided the bulk of funding that allowed us to do all of this work. And that's the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. And happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Hanash, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move to the live Q&A portion of the presentation. And as a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So let's take a look. We already have some incoming questions. Dr. Hanash. What if a biomarker screening test is positive and the follow-up imaging test is negative? What would be done? 
Well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And I gave the example of the pan-Canadian screening cohort where uh, our lead biomarker was positive before the CT became positive and before subjects were diagnosed with lung cancer. And so what we have learned from that sort of finding or experience is that indeed the CT could be negative, but a negative CT does not mean that the subject doesn't have cancer. And so there are two uh, options in that situation. One is not to wait another year or two years before you get the follow-up CT, but do uh, uh, repeat the imaging modality much earlier than that, let's say two months uh, after the blood test that turned out positive then was done. That could be uh, basically one way of dealing with it. Another would be to go back to that CT, it may have been considered negative, or maybe there was a very small nodule that people thought that the radiologists thought, well, this is unlikely to be cancer, but given that the blood test was positive, then go back and take a second look at the low dose CT, or beyond that, go to an MRI or another imaging modality. So I think the uh, positive blood test should uh, have an impact on how the subject is followed. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanash. We have time for one more question. Given differences in subject characteristics, would markers perform similarly in different countries? <clears throat> Again, that's also a good question. And, and so we have uh, uh, launched back uh, when I moved to MD Anderson, a lung cancer screening cohort in the United States. And we also have two sites, one in Paris and one in Madrid that have collected blood from subjects. And we have a major collaboration with the Chinese Cancer Center in Beijing, uh, whereby we have recruited more than 6,000 subjects that went through lung cancer screening. Uh, our preliminary data so far from different studies that we have done is that the marker panels, at least the ones that we've uh, assembled are robust enough that uh, it does not matter whether you're dealing with a particular ethnicity uh, that the markers would be positive. But that's something that needs to be obviously validated uh, directly by looking at subjects from different communities. Uh, one of the issues, for example, that a particular community or a particular country might have a lot a higher frequency of particular chronic infections, for example, that may uh, uh, affect the performance of the marker panel. So those things have to kind of be done under due diligence. Thank you again, Dr. Sam Hanash, and thank you to our audience for your outstanding questions. We hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. Don't miss on the other valuable presentations on this agenda and visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, bye-bye.